Hello and welcome to another edition of the Animation Archives. This episode will be covering another Ghibli classic, Princess Mononoke. Princess Mononoke was released in Japan in 1997, and it would be another two years before it arrived on western shores. It's set in a fantastical version of the Morimachi period of Japan. The story is kick-started when a demon attacks a small village and is then swiftly defeated by their prince, Ashitaka. However, his victory isn't something to be celebrated, for now Ashitaka carries a curse that grows from his arm and threatens to corrupt his whole body and eventually destroy him. The demon itself was once a god, and an iron ball was found in its chest and is believed to be the thing that drove the creature mad. The village oracle advises Ashitaka to head west if he wishes to seek the cause of his dreadful fate. But by making his journey, he can never return home. Ashitaka! Kaya, what are you doing here? You know it's forbidden. Do you think I care about that? I came to give you this so you won't forget your little sister. Your crystal dagger. Kaya, I can't take this. Please keep it with you, brother, to protect you. You must take it with you, please. I want you to have it. So you won't forget. Kaya, you know I could never forget you. I should say right here and now, this is probably my favourite film of all time, with only Fight Club posing as a possible challenger to its position. I have a lot of emotions tied up in this movie, so this episode has proved particularly hard to write. Like with My Neighbour Totoro, I'm going to assume everyone watching this has already seen the film, as I am not going to examine it plot point by plot point. Oh, and here's your customary spoiler warning. Being a show about animated films and TV shows, it might seem weird to you that I don't dedicate a portion of these episodes just to talk about aesthetics. This is because I have felt in the past that simply showing you the animation while playing the soundtrack in the background conveys what I would have said more effectively. Princess Mononoke is a special case. Almost every moment of Princess Mononoke could be framed and placed in a gallery. The art direction on display is masterful. The environments have a similar look and feel to the work of painters like Turner, and have the power to evoke strong emotions with but a glance. Joe Hisashi's score is also breathtaking. I mean, just listen to this. Both of these aesthetic elements are strong individually, but it's when they are combined that they reach their true potential. For me, personally, as an audio-visual experience, Princess Mononoke is nothing short of transcendent. It's Morrow! <laughs> This is a common theme throughout Miyazaki's work, but none of his films discuss the subject in the detail and complexity of Princess Mononoke. Princess Mononoke isn't filled with the same hope and happiness for the future the way many of Miyazaki's earlier films are. This speaks of a man who is increasingly worried about the direction mankind is taking itself, and that lessons are not being learnt. Here is a quote from the man himself. We've made many films in the past, and our goal with those films has been to send a message of hope and the possibility of happiness to growing children. 
What we realised was that by continuing to make movies that only taught them about hope and happiness, we were in fact turning a deaf ear to their very urgent needs and pleas, and if we did not make a movie that directly addressed their needs and pleas, we no longer would have the right to make films that would encourage them to be hopeful and happy. So we made this film knowing that we would need to step outside the boundaries of what you call entertainment. We made this film from a sense of mission. I think the reason why I prefer Princess Mononoke to so many films with an ecological message is that it acknowledges that these aren't easy problems to solve and it doesn't have the arrogance to come up with solutions of its own. The film only wishes that we would all sit down and at least think about what we're doing to the world around us, rather than unsustainably trudging forward. The film doesn't preach the message that mankind's progress is bad and that nature is inherently good. Rather, it asks us to manage our antagonism with nature so that we might find some kind of balance, which neatly moves us on to the next subject. What do you plan to do? What exactly are you here for? To see with eyes unclouded by hate. To see with eyes unclouded by hate. Those words have spoke to me on such a personal level that it has become a quality I strive for in life. Negative emotions blind us to the whole picture, so that we are only able to see things from a narrow perspective. The relationship between Lady Eboshi and San is a great example of this. Both see each other as either unquestionably evil and or a wild and dangerous threat to the people they care about. The reality is, both are flawed human beings with genuine positive intentions. Lady Eboshi is ruthless, greedy and short-sighted, however, she is also quite selfless she established Iron Town not only to further her own goals, but to protect and care for the people who no one else would look after. The women who work in the iron mill may have tough lives, but their situation in Iron Town is far better than the lives they led as prostitutes. And the lepers she cares for would have no lives at all if it weren't for Roboshi. San is reckless, highly strung, and occasionally a tad irrational. Yet she is fiercely loyal and is ready to fight and die for her cause. And to be fair, her cause and those of the creatures of the forest takes a longer, more sustainable view on things than the cause of those who dwell in Iron Town. So blinded are they by their hate for one another and their opposing goals that they are incapable of seeing each other as anything more than a beast or a monster. And that's why Ashitaka's presence in this conflict is so important. What do you think you're doing, boy? Stay your hand. The girl's life is now mine. I'm sure she'll make a lovely wife for you. There's a demon inside of you. It's inside both of you. Look, everyone! This is what hatred looks like. This is what it does when it catches hold of you. It's eating me alive, and very soon now it will kill me. Fear and anger only make it grow faster. I'm getting a little bored of this curse of yours, Ashitaka. Let me just cut the damn thing off! Oh! Ashitaka is the voice of reason, of diplomacy, of compromise. Having no real allegiances to either side, he is able to examine the situation logically and comes to the conclusion that neither side is wholly justified in their actions. So many heroes in fiction are uncompromising radicals that it makes me so glad that Ashitaka exists. He may not be the most complex or interesting character in the movie, but as a symbol he speaks to me more than any other protagonist I've encountered. He is a tiny bit of a Mary Sue, but I can forgive it because it's deliberate and the goal with this characterization is to convey a message. We are Sam. 
We are Lady Eboshi. We are the people of Iron Town. We are the creatures of the forest. Ashitaka is there to show us who we should be striving to be. Not an angry radical who wishes to further their own personal goals, but a humble individual who sees the bigger picture and seeks balance and harmony so that everyone can be happy. When I think of art that has truly touched me and tapped into something at the core of my being, Princess Mononoke is one of many examples that constantly comes to mind. The film has had a profound effect on me and how I view others and the world. It is a masterpiece. Thank you.